Hello, and welcome to another spooky Halloween episode of Feel Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Samashkar Panuri, Karen Harris Schultz, Joseph Knoll, and Shinji Ni about this year's scary pest, sorghum aphid. This name-changing little monster can reproduce faster than a zombie horde, with devastating impacts on sorghum crops around the world. In this episode, Sam, Karen, Joe, and Shinji join me to discuss the many tools researchers are adding to their toolkits in the fight against this deadly horde. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have four lovely guests with us. Dr. Tomashkar Panuri is an associate research professor at Fort Valley State University. He received his PhD in plant sciences from Oklahoma State University in 2011. His research focuses on breeding of crops for biotic and abiotic stress with use of host plant resistance and most advanced tools in breeding, such as high throughput phenotyping, AI, and machine learning. He is also the SEED, or the Scientist Engaging and Educating Decision Makers Ambassador for the Science Advocacy Program to Lawmakers. Dr. Karen Harris-Schultz is a research geneticist at USDA ARS. She earned a PhD in biochemistry from Texas A&M University. And for the last 17 years with USDA ARS, she has identified and utilized genetic regions associated with economically important traits in watermelon, sorghum, and turf grasses. She also performed the genotyping of U.S. sugarcane aphid samples from 2015 to 2020 and identified that this invasive pest was spreading as one super clone. Dr. Joseph Knoll is also a research geneticist at USDA ARS. He earned his Ph.D. in plant breeding and genetics from Purdue University in 2007. His research interests include improvement of corn for reduced aflatoxin, improvement of sorghum, including sweet sorghum, for resistance to diseases and insects, and bioenergy cropping systems. Dr. Shinji Ni is a research entomologist at USDA ARS. He received his PhD in entomology from the University of Missouri-Columbia in 1993. His research interests include improvement of corn and sorghum for resistance to multiple insect pests, an understanding of genetic and ecological interactions between crops and pests to improve integrated pest management programs. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. How are you today? We're doing, doing great. great. Wonderful. Well, we are so glad to have you, um, specifically on our special Halloween episode uh, that we do every year, where we look at a scary pest and what we are doing to stop it in its scary tracks. So to get started here, can you just give us some good background on the sorghum aphid kind of, well, sorghum itself for just a general person like me is like, I've heard of it, but I don't know a lot about it. And then also just the sorghum aphid itself, kind of when it showed up, what kind of damage it does and how severe that is. Maybe some of the things we've tried in the past, anything like that. Thanks, Abby. Uh, thanks for having us on this podcast. So, uh, sorghum is very important grain crop in the U.S. Uh, about 11 million metric tons has been produced annually here. It's a water-efficient and fertilizer-efficient crop with excellent abiotic stress tolerance. Uh, it's one of the climate-smart crop, uh, you know, for all these features. So, grain sorghum is widely grown, followed by forest sorghum. And sweet sorghum is also produced to produce syrup, typically on smaller farms if Farmers are interested, they grow on this and uh, they produce syrup. And uh, sorghum biomass has also potential uh, for bio bioenergy feedstock. So it's one of the main crop for uh, future bioenergy. So um, sorghum itself is a very important crop in US. It needs more attention because uh, it is a gluten-free crop and uh, people should know more about the byproducts of using it. Um, our uh, Review paper, which is on invasive aphid, aphid of uh, this sorghum aphid. Um, it's it's a very important review paper where we're trying to cover a lot of information over the last ten years. How this pest become an invasive pest, and uh, what we know about this pest over the last ten years. And this paper talks in detail about uh, what are the genetic resources and genomic resources available 
and what we uh, uh, know about this in the last 10 years in terms of what are the molecular mechanisms involved in uh, resistance uh, from sorghum crop to this pest, uh, what are uh, different signals involved in sorghum aphid interactions, what are different uh, aphid genotypes. So it covers in detail a lot about uh, what we know about this pest in the last 10 years. My other colleagues uh, will go in detail about these sections now. So the, the aphid was first discovered uh, near Beaumont, Texas, back in 2013, on grain sorghum, and it was a it was sort of a new pest. They hadn't seen it before, and then by 2014, uh, we started seeing it over here in Georgia, and then by 2015, they had pretty much spread across most of the sorghum growing regions. And at that point, you know, it became apparent just how destructive they could be. Like we could see it in our sorghum nurseries here, just near complete devastation of our sorghum nurseries. In terms of damage, um, the sugarcane aphid is very impressive, mainly because it reproduces so well. It feeds by removing sap directly from the leaves. And starting in 2013, the aphid spread from state to state until it reached all sorghum growing regions. The damage could range from just slight pigmentation of the leaves to prevention of the head emergence to plant death. And so, of course, um, there was reduced yield and grain quality. Farmers really struggled to harvest grain sorghum, uh, mainly because the sugarcane aphid produces a real sticky honeydew as an excrement, and that coats the leaves. And so as the combine tried to harvest the sorghum, it would become clogged. And so at that time, it was very devastating. And um, a lot of universities and government researchers got together and they've done some beautiful work. So they really um, have helped control this pest. You probably, I can just add for aphid uh, excreted honeydew because the high population and also the aphid population can develop explosively in the sorghum field. It really overwhelms the plants. In addition to that is the excretion from the aphid called honeydew, like Karen mentioned earlier, can also led to the growth of sooty mold. It's a black mold on a leaf surface. That would affect the plant development as well. The other thing I want to point out is this aphid can overwinter at our location, Tifton, Georgia. And we are at a 31.5 degree north power now. So it can overwinter on the other perennial host like uh, Johnson grass as well as giant Miss Kansas. And then when sorghum planted, they can migrate to the so we feel that's all I would add. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great overview. I have a couple of questions off of that one. So I'm going to ask both of them before I forget them. And you guys can just decide who, who wants to take them. So the first question I have is you mentioned that this was kind of like a new pest. So I was curious, is this just like a species that just kind of naturally migrated? Was it an invasive species? Was it just kind of like a it bred itself into a new species kind of thing. I'm curious if we kind of know where it came from. Um, but then also, I, there was kind of an interesting factoid about kind of like a naming thing where it was originally the sugar cane aphid and now we think it's a, like a different thing. So I would just be curious to get a little background on that little switcheroo that happened uh, over time. Well, so the sugar cane aphid, in terms of it being in the U.S. before 2013, it was. It was um, mainly in the coastal regions on sugar cane. But in 2013, when it showed up on sorghum, that's why it was called the sugar cane aphid. And at that time, it was classified um, Melanaceous saccharae. With time, there was a suggested change to Melanaceous sorghi and I can talk about that in the genetic section because um, I don't want to so stay tuned. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. A little teaser for what's come next. Speaking of, there were many areas of research that were covered in this paper, as Sam already mentioned. So, yeah, I'm, I might uh, take these ones a little bit more one at a time because there's a lot of interesting information about these. So first... Uh, you guys were looking at what we've learned about kind of the biology of plant aphid interaction. So tell me more about that. Sorghum aphid produces asexually. It produces young aphids. That's another unique feature. And uh, so they 
can develop completed the larval development called nymphs development in a short period of time. Then the population doubling time will be so faster than other insects. And uh, I can repeat this section in a short couple of sentences. Sog aphid produces asexually. It produces young aphid. In another word, would be born pregnant, if we may use the term that way, rather than laying eggs. And uh, the other point uh, would be the sorghum aphids, they like hot and humid climates, and it is far, is far now where sorghum crop is grown, southern U.S. states, mainly. It can experientially reproduce in a rather short period of time after initial infestation and colonize the sorghum plants. Like we mentioned earlier, high aphid infestation can overwhelm and kill young sorghum plants and cause crop failure. Joe, you want to go next? Yeah. Yeah. So the aphids, the way they they feed um, is they have a, a little piercing mouth part called a stylet. Think of like a little syringe almost. And they stick that little mouth part into the plant and they tap the the phloem, which is where the sugar, the sugary liquid in the plant is. And they they extract the sugar directly from the plant. And, you know, one or two aphids doesn't cause a lot of damage, but since they reproduce so fast, you can have thousands of aphids on a leaf all extracting the sugar from this plant. And uh, that's how they, they overwhelm and weaken the plant. Now, the plant does have certain ways that it can defend itself from from this attack. And so in our paper, we talk about a lot of the mechanisms that plants can use to defend themselves against an aphid attack. And some of them are similar to the ways that plants use to defend themselves against, say, a fungus invading the leaf or something like that. So uh, these different mechanisms are mostly like antibiosis, which is kind of uh, a plant produces some sort of chemicals or something that reduces the ability of aphids to reproduce, or uh, anti-xenosis, which is non-preference. Somehow, these plants make them fly away, not to come towards them. Or another mechanism is tolerance. So using all these different mechanisms, plants defend themselves to these aphids. And also, they use a first line of defenses, such as waxes and trichomes. These are the ways plants produce and uh, uh, you know uh, stop these aphids by entering with what Joe said, uh, they start feeding on these plants. Great. Yeah. Lots of good insights there that we've learned in in this recent season of greater activity for these, these creatures. So you also were doing some or reviewing some research about kind of the genetics of the aphids themselves as kind of a way to find better tools to continue to fight the good fight. So I believe that was Karen's research. So Karen, did you want to talk on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I'll tell you a little bit about the history of genetics of the sugarcane aphid. Um, it all started um, with Samuel Nemoche out of France. And um, he looked at um, sugarcane aphids on sorghum and sugarcane, and he sampled from um, 15 countries. And so he found that um, they all grouped. I mean, he calls these multi-locus lineages, um, but those to me are just groups. And I would think of it that way. And so um, it's all group, like group A was from Africa, B was from Australia. For us at that time, he sampled in 2007 and um, we have multi-locus lineage D out of the U.S. And that was just from samples from sugar cane that he sampled from Hawaii and Louisiana. So when the aphids arrived in Texas in 2013 on grain sorghum, everybody was kind of curious, is this um, what's going on? Why are these aphids that we thought was D on sugarcane, why are they suddenly so aggressive on sorghum? And we've never seen this before. So we were rather curious, what groups do we have? Are they, you know, we wondered if they were sexual at that time. There'd been some reports out of South America. We later learned that was not true, but we were rather intrigued. And so we started um, asking for people to send us aphids. Uh, Dr. Nee and I came up with this idea in 2015, send us aphids. And so each year we genotyped um, all the aphid samples 
from that we received and we put kind of all put all everybody's work together so you don't hear the full history but we found that it was um the sugarcane aphid is spreading as one genotype and we call that a super clone it's one genotype spreading through a huge area and it's a very successful reproducer as dr Nee mentioned and they called this now multi-locus lineage f a new genotype and we also found multi-locus lineage f this group on Johnson grass that Dr. Nee mentioned, giant miscanthus. Um, it's also on sugar cane and Columbus grass. All of these are kind of related to sorghum. Multi-locus lineage D is still present on sugar cane as well as F. And um, we also recently did some genotyping of some samples we received from Brazil because they had an outbreak, I believe in 2020. And so those also, they had spread now multi-locus lineage F to Brazil. And the people additionally that aren't um, part of our group, but also from Argentina, Mexico, and Haiti also found that this aphid had spread. So not only had it moved through the U.S., but it has spread to other countries as well. All right. And I know you asked about um, the name change, and that was proposed um, from Samuel de Bush out of France. Using morphological and molecular evidence, he suggested changing um, the species based on their grouping. And so um, A and F would be sore guy, C and D would be saccharide, and B and E, he said he wasn't too sharp. So you get back with them on that. So that was why um, the name changed. Fascinating. I, I have a question about this. So how does a super clone start? Like, I assume since they're asexual, it's kind of just the genetic material is, you know, just going to easily pass because you're not mixing genes as they reproduce. Is it just like this small group did really well and flourished kind of like a evolutionary selection kind of thing that they just found a way to flourish in different ways than a different group or like how does that work yeah that that's a great question and there is somebody that wrote a recent paper on that exact subject and what he found was that there are certain genotypes of aphids that are just superior in their environment um they have a couple of features um, one, they reproduce without having to find the love of their life, right? So parthogenetically, they make clones of themselves. They also aren't too picky about hosts. So they can use multiple hosts, so a wide host range. And also they have what they, he calls phenotypic plasticity, where they can adapt pretty well to their environment. And so those genotypes can really take off. And if reproduction is high, you can have super clones in a lot of different species. So aphids are pretty amazing in that. I might have had another elusive aphid request on wheat in western U.S. It is a Russian wheat aphid. In the late 80s, 1987 was the first time finding Texas. It's a fascinating quest as well. Yeah. But that's also sure. a asexually reproduced. Just to spoil whatever parent mission. You've mentioned that these, I mean, these tiny little aphids are really booking it as they're kind of spreading across all of these regions in a matter of years. They're so small. How, like, are they flying there? Are they hitching a ride? Like, how are they spreading? Is it just a numbers game where, you know, if you have a billion things that are, you know, can travel in an inch, you can get quite far quite quickly. Like, how do they move so fast across these different regions? They usually ride on weather pattern. Many insects, migratory insects, uh, aphids, leaf hoppers, migratory moths, all those pests, main agriculture pests, they all ride on weather pattern. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, they can survive on the overwintery coast and when weather condition is right, they will ride on weather pattern, but high we need temperature rise and they will uh, ride on the weather pattern, get it to the field and infest the crop. Aphids are really neat in that even though they're the same genotype, those genotypes, depending on the environment, can become winged. And so those are called Thank alates. You. Thank you. And those winged aphids are what is causing that spread. And they hop on just what Dr. Nee was saying onto the winds and they are excellent at riding those winds and moving um and they they have a number of kilometers per year it's very impressive i'd have to look up the number but that is how they're moving um just those winged aphids and that that's a important point i also would like to add 
when they arrive, when the wind wave is arrived in the field, they will produce wind less safe to overwhelm the plants. Once crowded and the plant cultivation is getting worse, they will back to the mode of producing wind if it again, spread in the field again. That's how they can overwhelm the field of crop. That's incredible. I had yeah. no idea that they could do that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, talk about a super villain. My goodness. What an ability. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Man, this, uh, like, in the back of my mind in these episodes is always, like, the Halloween factor. And I'm like, what a spooky thing to be able to, I mean, they're really just built to really be devastating in these ways. Which brings me back to the ways that we are learning to fight them off. So, Joe, I know you were doing then kind of on the flip side, the genetics of the plant itself and some of its ability to resist these little little monsters. So, uh, uh, creatures, they're, they're, they're doing their thing. Uh, shouldn't be too judgy about them. Uh, so, tell me about your research. Certainly. Well, so, some growers will call them little monsters. Oh, good. <laughs> I try to strike oh. the balance of like, it's oh, just okay. nature doing nature versus like, they're really not great though. So, sorry, so go ahead. When the, uh, when the aphids first started, when the outbreak first started, we initiated a project called the uh, Area-Wide Pest Management uh, Project. And that was a cooperative effort between ARS and the regional universities and the extension folks. And part of that was just screening some of the existing sorghum hybrids that were already on the market. And surprisingly, there was there was some material out there that already did have some genetic resistance just by luck. There were a few hybrids already out there that, that had some natural resistance to it. And then we, we screened a lot of our uh, breeding material and I actually was was pretty lucky. I mentioned how devastated my nursery was. Um, I do a lot of sweet sorghum breeding, and most of the nursery was just just trashed. But you could see a few rows that were just green and healthy right next to these rows that were just covered in honeydew and sooty mold and aphids everywhere. And so uh, we had some natural resistance in there too. And so we were able to take some of those lines and advance them and uh, we eventually got three uh, sweet sorghum lines with, with good aphid tolerance that we were able to release uh, based on that work. And then we found a lot of other material um, out of the USDA gene bank that also had some natural resistance to it. And we've done some some mapping studies to try to figure out where the genes are for the resistance. And there have been multiple studies done, and a lot of the, a lot of the studies have found a, a big gene cluster on chromosome 6. And there seems to be multiple genes on chromosome 6 that, that are have a, a role to play in uh, resistance to the aphid. And there's some other genes on other chromosomes as well, but number 6 seems to be the, the big one. Nice. Yeah. Lucky, lucky number 6. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciated that it was like very fortunate that you just already had some built into the plant. I mean, we talk about plant breeding often on this show uh, because I love talking about plant breeding and just how long it can take to kind of stack things rightly and pinpoint things and get the right leads to find the right genes that you need. So that's awesome that there's already some that you could, you know, see phenotypically was already there. <laughs> uh, so that's wonderful. And then the next and final large area that you were looking at in this paper was kind of the use of drones and AI as a possibility to combat these creatures. So um, Sam and Jinji, I think that was your area of expertise. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, uh, like Joe mentioned, you know, uh, these um, little monsters, very difficult to uh, phenotype them for research purpose. And um, we uh, were funded uh, in 2019 from USDA NEFA to develop a capacity building project at Fort Valley State University and I was a lead PI where we wanted to develop some high throughput methods and we wanted to use drones and robots. So we did use drones in a sorghum association panel experiment which was conducted at Tifton and we did uh, use drones to measure vegetation in diocese that were used in our uh, genome-wide association studies. Uh, where we could show that uh, some of these regions were overlapping with the manual measurements for refrigerations because, uh, you know, manual measurement is very uh, difficult and it's uh, 
uh, cumbersome and it involves a lot of people. So w these methods can definitely help us in the future if we want to develop a precision in phenotyping, especially these if it's are beneath the lead surface and they're very tiny. So we definitely need such tools in the future. So we, we are trying to use these, but we didn't have much luck with the robot. We're still working because these methods are still evolving and uh, they're very slowly developing. So we, we are working on these methods, uh, but we definitely found some good results using uh, uh, both manual and drone to identify some of the most uh, significant regions like Joe mentioned chromosome 6. But in our paper, we found uh, not just the chromosome 6, but other regions because our hypothesis that uh, in that paper was to show uh, it's not just chromosome 6 that's uh, uh, important, but are there any other regions uh, that are important for uh, sorghum aphid resistance? And we could show there are four resistant plants uh, which were uh, coming from different parts of the globe that were resistant to sorghum aphid. And uh, these four lines are being used by most of the researchers to develop uh, aphid resistant varieties. Uh, th that was a part of the drone uh, that uh, we did to study and uh, uh, and we are still trying to work on new methods such as AI and machine learning to understand this pest, to use different cameras to capture these uh, aphids from the leaf surface and we are trying to quantify them. Uh, that's part of my research. Dr. Nee? Yeah, I would like to mention uh, another similar study using drone to uh, assess special and the temporal patterns of sorghum aphid infestations and the, its damage on the crop, as well as yield yield of silage sorghum production. And the, the study demonstrated that the drone platforms can be used for damage evaluation, which can be adapted to large scale phenotyping of segregating populations of all type of sorghum germplasm development. I think that's important for us to select the best accessions for breeding. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Song, Karen, Joe, and Shinji's paper, Invasive Sorghum Aphid, a decade of research on deciphering plant resistance mechanisms and novel approaches in breeding for sorghum resistance to aphids, published in Crop Science, is always freely available. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. What I like about this paper, as with most review papers, is it's kind of bringing all of these different pieces into a larger pool of knowledge, a larger strategy. Um, so what would you say, having done this review paper, is or are some of the kind of key takeaways or strategies that you're finding or just ways that you can leverage this knowledge now that you have kind of a larger data set to, to be working from, as it were? Well, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, uh... Uh, still, there is a long way to uh, develop these methods of uh, phenotyping, aphid population number, as well as damage using high-throughput phenotyping approaches because new uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning or deep learning can definitely support us in the future, how we can score these aphids, how we can quantify them, how we can show a plant is more resistant to these aphids. So definitely... Um, we can take a lot of learning from uh, in last 10 years, what are different genes that are involved and what are uh, different mechanisms that are involved or what are different uh, resistant sources that are involved. So we can combine all these using all these high throughput phenotyping methods to uh, give more better picture of what exactly uh, these resistant genes look like. A key takeaway that I um, got from the review paper was that uh, very few genes have been identified um, that confer sugarcane aphid resistance. So um, we know that there's one gene on chromosome 9 that's been identified. It was a, a worky gene, but um, a lot of QTLs, especially on that chromosome 6, have been identified, but n absolutely no knowledge of the causal variant. So um, if somebody wanted to tackle that, I think that would be a good method to go. Are a good way to go. I think a, another takeaway from this review is that you know in in 
10 short years, we've actually been quite successful with breeding and developing new uh, resistant varieties. And that's still going to be, um, although we do have some effective uh, insecticides in our, our toolbox that we can use to control this pest, the most cost-effective method is going to be to plant resistant varieties. And that's that's been very successful. As I mentioned, we released three sweet sorghum lines with resistance. ARS at Lubbock released a couple of grain sorghum lines with resistance. Texas A&M released like 20, I think, um, all with good resistance. And there's more uh, coming down the pike. So with the, the new genetic marker information and new phenotyping tools, we should be able to continue developing more good resistant varieties with, with good yields. Yeah, we have, uh, like John mentioned, we have some lines in the pipeline. What we are continuously working on towards a new inbred line. As the new inbred lines. The other thing I want to add, like Joe mentioned for the, from the uh, integrated pest matter, he touched up on the insecticide. I think our team also for the this integrated pest management, Dr. Tay's group, also examined the planting dates. I should see our airway project examine the planting dates, insecticide applications. We use uh, two ways of, for the insecticide ap- application. One is the foliar spring, the other one is the inferior application at planting. It tests a different method. In addition to the host plant resistance, we test the synergism among the different uh, management tools. The other thing I want to add would be the review on the sorghum aphid paper has brought in ramifications for managing invasive pest outbreaks on crops in general. Like I mentioned, this is a new example of an invasive aphid species, so different from the Russian wheat aphid, only infest the wheat plants who west through brackets, and these wines stay on the warm and humid part of the country. It's so different, but I and they have the same same features we can learn from and for future invasive pest outbreaks. And uh, the second point I want to make is, I think our team probably is one of the first, if not the first, look at both crop genetics and the use of genetics and to manage the pest outbreaks from both weights, and uh, as well as look at the ecological aspects of crop like crop phenology, as well as insect migration and different ecological aspects of the pest. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is uh, we are still building on what we learned and continuously working on to manage this pest successfully and learn more about uh, after we control the outbreak in future, how we can make sure this pest monitoring and make sure this pest or population will be on, on check, wouldn't be another uh, way to all the uh, outbreaks. I think that's, we, I think the uh, review people also touch up on that. That's where we try our best to work on this. Yeah, I love that. I'm, we're huge fans of kind of this interdisciplinary research uh, on the show and integrated pest management using different strategies to to make it work. So lovely to see that in this paper as well. Uh, So we've touched a little bit on this already of future research, but is does anybody have any additional areas where they're hoping to continue to see work done? I think uh, it's very important for us to continuously working on aphid genetics as well as crop genetics to manage this pest. I mentioned earlier as well for not having another wave of outbreaks because some of the pests and because plants can defend them themselves, insects can counter defend themselves. And as they just see in a rivalry, we need to monitor both sides, the genetics of both crop and the pest to make sure they are on check and to, to be relevant with the review paper. According to me, in the future research, uh, we need to uh, use all the new existing technologies such as CRISPR or haplotype-based breeding or genomic predictions. There are a lot of genome sequence information available. A lot of pan-genomes are becoming available in sorghum. 
So we can use all these to develop uh, targeted uh, development of insect resistant varieties in sorghum. And uh, these fields can definitely help us develop new varieties uh, for sorghum community. And also there are new fields such as microbiome, which we can use to understand how these microbes impart resistance to plants. And sorghum has an extensive root system and it could better help in carbon sequestration in the soil. And we can use soil microbiome studies to enhance this character. Yeah. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about biocontrol. Um, so when the aphids hit a sorghum field, a lot of insects, the predators of aphids, especially lady beetles and their larvae, um, will start feeding on them, and as well as parasitoids. And, and the parasitoids are pretty amazing um, in aphids. That is a Halloween spooky story. An aphid, you know, just happily feeding on a sorghum leaf, a tiny little wasp will lay its eggs into its body. And so that little wasp will develop and eat the poor aphid from the inside out. Um, but unfortunately, these biological controls and those the predators and the parasitoids just can't keep up with the reproduction of the aphids. And so one of the things that we looked at um, and one of the things that we really noticed was that the animal pathogens can wipe out a field rapidly. And so what happens is when we look at our sorghum field, and this is great for a sorghum farmer, but really devastating for some of us that might be raiding for aphids, is that fungi will spread um, from aphid to aphid rapidly. And it'll be just like spraying insecticide. Um, it'll cause a complete um, a crash of the aphid population. So we were interested in seeing at first if we could apply commercially available animal pathogens um, to our sorghum fields. And we did these with a collaborator, some petri dish studies to test it out. And it killed aphids like you would not believe. And so we thought, oh, well, we'll try this out in the field and see how it goes. And we even reared our own strain. And unfortunately, Assam was involved in this project too. It did not control aphids at all. So we thought, you know, well, sometimes things don't work out. Let's go with plan B. Um, so the next idea was, why don't we use the existing animal pathogens in the field and try to figure out what they are and maybe we can grow them. So I was really fortunate to work with an animal pathogen expert, Luella Castrillo, and we collected aphids um, from Georgia on sorghum and um, to identify what they are. And so she was able... Um, to identify that there was two different fungal pathogens present on the farm, and I'll let Joe follow up with this. So our hope is that we can take these um, these entomal pathogen, this fungi, the insect killing fungi, and be able to culture them in the laboratory, and then mix them into some sort of a formulation, and then we're going to actually test them first in the greenhouse, and then in the field to see if they can actually cause what we saw in the field before this population crash in the aphids, but be able to get it to get the population to crash before they reach a, a damaging level. So that, that's an experiment that's uh, kind of that's in the works. And then another area of research that probably needs some more more work is uh, forage sorghum resistance to uh, sorghum aphid. A lot of the, most of the resistant lines have been discovered in grain sorghum. There hasn't been as much work done on forage sorghum. So these are these are taller plants where you take you, you harvest the entire plant and use it as a, a fodder for like cattle or something like that. I'm so glad that you brought up the physical characteristics because I realized a couple questions ago that I never actually asked what sorghum looks like. And I know that uh Sam, when you were working on your project with the drones, like part of the problem with counting aphids is that they hide on the underside of the leaf so you can't just fly over. So being who I am, I have a very limited number of plants for like mental reference. And it's like wheat and corn and soybeans and like flax <laughs> like are like plants that I know what they look like or like bulrushes. But like what? So what am I? What should I be picturing when I think of sorghum? What does this plant actually look like? So it kind of looks like a corn plant. So big, big leaves. Um, but instead of having the grain growing on ears on the side of the plant, it's all in a big grain head up on the top of the plant. And so grain sorghums, that grain head is at about, you know, maybe three feet off the ground. So you could run a combine through there and harvest those. 
whereas forage sorghums get really tall. They look more like a cornfield would. And sweet sorghums also, uh, they get very tall. Because with sweet sorghum, you actually take the stalk and you squeeze the juice out to make the syrup. Okay. All right. So kind of sugar cane adjacent in that, in yeah, that sense. Like, yeah, like an annual sugar cane almost. Okay. It, and when you say a grain head is like wheat, what I should be picturing, like a little stalk with like grains coming out the sides, is that? Bigger than a head of wheat yeah. though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like the same like shape kind of idea. Sort of no, heads come in all really. kinds of shapes. Yeah. Some are compact. Other it's more here. like a cereal crop. Okay. Okay. Cool. Listeners, this is your opportunity to start Googling all the different kinds. I certainly will do so myself after the show, get myself a little extra education because uh, podcasting is not a visual medium. So, but yeah, that's wonderful um, to hear about all of these different areas for future research. And yeah, I mean, I was thinking earlier in the show, you guys have really done a lot in the since this has become such a big problem. So huge, huge kudos to you, all of you for all the work that you and others have done to address this problem. So I have three questions left for you. The first one is if people want to learn more about any of the things that we've talked about, where can they go? I know I talked about this earlier, but I do have a favorite review article um, and I sent the link. I'm not sure if I'll be able to see it, but it's called Biological and Genetic Features of Introduced Aphid Populations in Agroecosystems. And so if they were wanting to learn more, I think it's just beautifully written. I enjoy reading it every time. And also sorghum is a climate smart crop and uh, people can learn more about this crop by going to sorghum checkoff program or sorghum websites because it can help address a lot of issues related to climate crisis. It can sequester more carbon. So people can learn more about sorghum, how it's going to help us in the future. Perfect. Yeah, those are some great resources. We will for sure get a link to uh, that paper, Karen, as well as all of y'all's review. We'll have a link to that in the show notes, as always. So then the next question is if listeners want to take that next step and kind of get involved, whether that is as a farmer or researcher or just general person that is neither of those, uh, what can they do to get involved? Well, I would say that if you're a sorghum grower, and you're interested in this this pest, certainly contact your local uh, extension folks because they they do an amazing job helping growers to identify pests and giving them advice on how to control them and, and things like that. Perfect. Great advice. Shout out to Extension, some of our favorite people. My list of favorite people is quite long, but they're on there. Final question, the the hard question. What is one fun fact about each of you that listeners would not know if all they had was your research? Yeah, that's uh, kind of hardest question <laughs> I always face. So I like watching Indian movies, uh, music, sports, and I like watching cricket. I love photography. I love traveling with my family to outside country. Bonus fun facts. Love that. I'm a big fan of women's basketball, especially the WNBA. So I love watching it. There's a game tonight. I'll definitely be watching it, but I wish it was earlier. Um, I'm an avid runner. I probably log a good 12 plus miles a week, which some people think is just crazy, but um, I enjoy it. It's partly a social activity too, because we've got a great group of runners here in town that I run with. My next race is a 20K trail run on a nature preserve in Florida, which I'm pretty excited about. I've done it before. It's it's a really scenic place, just a lot of fun. I enjoy outdoor activities, of course, including photographing plants and the insects in the parks, in nature, as well as managed ecosystem. He does take very good photos. I'm, oh, trying. I'm still learning. I'm still learning. <laughs> I was going to mention, if you need some Halloween pictures, some of the leaf overwhelmed with a lot of aphids, it looks for some of the, for some people, it might be not a happy on their face. Might have, I'll consider you a one or two. Yeah, those are just a wonderful set of hobbies. Joe, I hope you don't run into any crazy Florida wildlife while you're down there. Also, you got to be careful where you <laughs> run in, in Florida. Yeah, so that's wonderful. This has been such a great conversation. I feel like I've learned a lot about just all the incredible work that you all have been doing in the past decade or so. 
um, and all the good research that is to come. So thank you for tackling a scary pest and coming to talk to us about it on Halloween. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you, Abby. Thanks for having us. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Student Spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Sarah. Welcome to the show. Can you start us off by introducing yourself and where you are studying? Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Chu. I'm a PhD candidate at Texas A&M University, studying under Dr. Muthu, focusing in on weed science. Awesome. And what specifically are you studying with weed science? So I'm looking at how to control weed seeds in a bunch of different type of cropping systems, including rice, wheat, and cotton, really focusing on how we could use our harvest practices to sort of target those weed seeds and possibly remove them from farmers' fields, preventing future weed issues for years to come. Great. And if you could have your dream research project, what would that look like? I would really like to look at how to spatially model weed populations in a given field. So sort of looking at how could we integrate newer technologies and predict where weeds are going to emerge in falling or future years. Awesome. Well, if you would like to get in touch with Sarah about her work, we'll have her contact information in our show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you. Thank you.